Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe. Today I'm going to be examining Cull the Conqueror or Cull of Atlantis a little more. A while back Dan and I did a bunch of videos about Cull. It was mostly reviews about the various stories and while I really like these stories I haven't actually sat down in a while and reread certain ones or fought back about Cull as a character. Cull is a character who often takes a back seat to his kind of reincarnation, in a way, his literary reincarnation. That is to say, Conan the Barbarian, Conan the Sumerian. Cull is not as well fleshed out as Conan, to be quite honest. Cull is also not the lead of as many stories. And it's undeniable that Conan is certainly the greatest character ever written by Robert E. Howard. He's also the most famous fantasy character of all times. But it is in Cull that I sometimes find myself drawn a little back to. And this is probably a little natural as I'm pretty introspective and introverted myself. Cull, as said, a lot more introverted than, say, Conan. Although it's interesting because there's a side to Cull that is a little different. There's a different tone to his stories. This is especially true in regards to those that involve Cull on the throne. Cull is a character who made his name when he first arrived in Volusia as a gladiator. There he won fame, and it's interesting that caught the eye of the king whilst he fought in the Colosseums, as this shows that he was likely regarded as little more than a pet barbarian by the city. What this shows is that either Cull was caught and enslaved, or he willingly went on to become a gladiator and all but happily sold himself there. Now, in battle, Cull has a tendency to fight more like a berserker than Conan does. Conan is a much more calculative fighter. Cull tends to, in battle, approach everything with a everything looks like a nail. Well then, he's the hammer to knock the nail into place. He also suffers from an obnoxious streak and a tendency to, sometimes when he's bored, cause trouble just for its own sake. There's a pathology to the man. As a general, after his gladiator days, Cull is the last bastion of defense Volusia has, and it's as a general that he truly shines. Elevated quickly when Volusia is in a time of trouble, then he ends up usurping the throne, takes over, and this is where Cull kind of loses steam. As a king, Conan seems to be very, very motivated. In some ways, as much as Conan enjoys his adventures, it seems as though he's not at home until he's kinging around, and that he genuinely enjoys leading armies. He genuinely enjoys kind of running roughshod over half of the Hiborian world. He also somewhat seems to enjoy the royal harems. He, if anything, he's rather like a Charlemagne or Henry II. There's a side of Conan that thrives on being king. Whereas Cull is king in a time of peace. Once he secures the throne and has to constantly watch his back against conspirators, evil snake men, and anyone who wishes to take his throne from him, Cull kind of becomes depressed. He's unmotivated. He's often sitting on his throne just feeling sorry for himself and wishing he had never taken the throne. Or he's just riding around on horseback and looking for trouble. It's... A rather sad state of affairs, as Cull kind of seems as though he regrets his very life. Just sitting there on his throne, he's rather pitiable in a way, and rather pathetic. Now, there are stories where he approaches being king with all the subtlety of a broad axe as well. Smashes, for example, with his axe, stone tablets that hold the laws of Volusia and says, I am the king. I am either king or corpse. If you like not my kingship, come and take this crown. By this axe I rule. This is my scepter. I am king. But what does he actually accomplish for himself? He's undeniably a good king. He does rule fairly well, or at least hands over a great deal of day-to-day -day affairs to his counselor too, and even to Brule, the spear slayer. But with no challenges worthy of his name, Cull just kind of slinks into despair. He does end up approaching things in a philosophical manner, so obviously he becomes very, very withdrawn and ponders the mysteries of the universe, and even gets mad at Brul when Brul saves him from Tuzun Thun, who tried to kill Cull, but Cull claims that the mirrors of Tuzun Thun were actually a gateway, and that they may have been able to show him the reason behind everything that's in existence. 
and the meaning of life, essentially. And Cole ends up trying to find a deeper meaning in every moment in life. What's also interesting is that he doesn't exactly seem a very amorous man. He's not terribly interested in the harems. He doesn't seem terribly interested in the law courts. He's not going around looking for trouble with his nobles. He just seems to expect the slightest attack against him, seeks out worthy talent to run his kingdom for him, and just generally wanders his palace looking for something to do. Where before he was a extremely motivated man, it may be that he is rather like Robert Baratheon from Game of Thrones, who, who was a vigorous, incredible giant of a man and could conquer almost any foe, but once he claimed the throne, he rusted like a cheap sword. Perhaps Cull is like that. And I know I'm painting a rather bleak image here, but there's something about Cull that, while philosophical, is fairly nihilistic. There's all there's some elements that are almost Nietzschean in just the approach that the character takes. And having read Thus Spake Zarathustra, there's quite a few scenes where you'd almost expect Cull to cry out, God is dead. And there's other scenes where you might expect him to probably deny such a statement. My point is, I do highly recommend these stories, but there's something rather tragic about Call. There's something rather conniving about the court that he's surrounded by, but he doesn't seem to do anything to stop the conspiracies. Rather, in some stories, he almost seems to welcome these conspiracies and eagerly await them as they break up the humdrum tedium of his regular day life, with assassins sent by political rivals and invasions basically treated as a sport for him. I do wonder if, near the end, Cull may have finally been cut down by his rivals, if he wasn't kind of sent to meet his maker in his old age by violence rather than by natural causes. What is also noteworthy is how Conan, while having terrible tempers, has a rather cheerful nature. This is not to say that Conan can't, does not enjoy the life that Conan lacks a philosophical side. Arguably, Conan in some ways is far more intelligent than Cull, but Cull just finds no meaning and thinks he's achieved the peak of his ambition. There's no temptation to improve the realm, usher in a golden age, or to find the most beautiful woman on earth and wed her and bed her, like with Conan. There's no desire to see the ends of the earth. There's no desire to conquer all the enemies around him and force all the neighboring nations to pay tribute to his glory. There's just a simple quiet and resignation to ruling a kingdom, passing it on whole and complete to his assassin or his son, and just passing along. He's living without any real enjoyment. But the question remains, is that really living? And I find myself kind of dissatisfied with the ending of the last Cull story. I would like to see a continuation. And that's where I'm thinking of probably picking up the Savage Sword of Cull, or at least some of the Cull comics from Marvel from back in the day. I've never read the Cull comics. I've read a few of the Conan ones. I actually enjoyed some of them. Although others I found terrible to the point of absurdity. And while I did enjoy the Cull movie for what it was, it did have a dissatisfying element to it. Especially since I'd rather watch Kevin Sorbo as Hercules from Legendary Journeys, which remains still one of my favorite shows of all times. So with that said, maybe in the coming months I'll review some Call the Conqueror comic books. Tell me what you think in the comments section. But next time, I'll be discussing with Dan in a book club the first chapter of The Phoenix on the Sword. So until then, feel free to smash that like and that subscribe button like your call smashing the, the law tablets to itty bitty pieces.